Let's go ahead and get started, folks. Uh, so, a couple of things before uh, before I introduce our speaker. Uh, first and foremost, we are starting our membership drive uh, for Signal's Eye for, for this year. If you are a student who is doing research and uh, who has either published or presented, we would like to encourage you to consider joining our organization. If you are a faculty member, who has published and is doing research, uh, we would like to encourage you to enjoy, uh, join our organization as well. A um, couple of things about Synthesi, kind of why, why is it worthwhile to join. Um, one reason in particular is it's, a, it's a, an honor, it's a recognition, so this is a research honor society. And if you've put in the time to do good research and to present that research and to publish that research and share it with the world, uh, you kind of owe it to yourself to, to get a little, little pat on the back, a little bit of recognition, right, for, for the work that you put in. Um, honestly, Sigur's Eye is the only organization that I've ever been asked to join. Everybody else is like, here, we'll take your money and you can be a member. APA, APS, right? Lots of lots of professional organizations. Uh, when I came to UNK, this is the only organization anyone's ever said, "Hey, Evan, it'd be nice if you were a member." Uh, and so today, I'm saying to you, a hey, person who's doing research, it'd be nice if you were a member. Um, that being said, there's uh, there's a lot of good networking opportunities for students. There is a a research conference specifically aimed at uh, allowing students the opportunity to present their research. Uh, Sigma Xi has grants available to help fund with a little bit of money anyway uh, towards research. If you're a seasoned researcher, somebody with uh, who's a little bit more advanced, uh, like a faculty member, uh, Sigma Xi is an awesome opportunity to collaborate, uh, to mentor other individuals, to receive some mentoring yourself. I absolutely have had some great collaborative research efforts with uh, Dr. Thomas here. Uh, Dr. Steele has been, wherever Dr. Steele wound up, okay, there she is. Dr. Steele has been incredibly helpful in making that collaborative effort work. And so, got some, got some collaborative research here, got some mentoring here. Uh, so there's, there's an excellent opportunity there. Uh, membership gets you access to uh, a huge network of researchers all over the world. Uh, lots and lots of Nobel laureates, uh, Nobel nominees in there. Uh, so it, it's a it's a huge community. It's a great opportunity. Um, on that note, Kim Carlson said that she will open up the shop to purchase some some schnazzy Sigma Xi embroidered uh, clothing, like the shirt I'm wearing now. There's t-shirts, women's t-shirts. Uh, they're great for dads, grads, your friend Vlad, right? Um, so, if uh, if you missed that opportunity in the fall and would like to do so, talk with Kim. Kim, how many people do we need? Ten? Seven. Seven? Seven. Threshold is very low now. Awesome. That's right, just in time for Valentine's Day. <laughs> <laughs> nothing, nothing says I love you like a single sign in murder poll. I'm just going to read <laughs> Let's see. Um, so, tonight's speaker is Dr. Catherine Bowen. She joined the psych department in the fall. She's originally from South Dakota, got her undergrad degree at South Dakota State, decided that uh, she needed to go to New Jersey and go to Seton Hall, got a master's at Seton Hall. After being in New Jersey, she decided that wasn't for her, went to Louisiana and got a PhD at Louisiana State University. Um, finished that last year? Yes. Yeah, finished that last year, and then came here to UNK. So, without further ado, Dr. Long. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hill, for that fantastic introduction. I am very excited to talk with you all today about some research that really optimized the last two years of my life in my PhD program. And I had the opportunity to work in this amazing collaborative environment. Before I dive in, 
I want to start off by thanking all of my amazing collaborators at LSU, specifically my PhD advisor, Dr. Melissa Beck, for putting up with me for five years and allowing me to work on this project. So there's a couple big takeaways that I want to start with. First, I want to encourage all of you to collaborate outside of your department. Obviously, any type of collaboration is fantastic, and I encourage you to do that, but it's amazing the types of things and the types of questions that we can answer when we have outside perspectives, looking at questions that we're interested in from a completely different perspective. So this project that I'm talking to you about today was a collaboration um, among the psychology department, the chemistry department, and computer science at LSU. Second, I want to talk to you about the benefits of a multi-method design, of using several different techniques to assess the same questions. So let's start off by talking about what mental rotation is. So let's say you're one of those people that doesn't enjoy taking organic chemistry classes. <laughs> Dr. Carlson, yes, And so imagine with me that you are at a furniture store and you are looking for the perfect couch for your house. And you finally come across a sectional that is the perfect shade of loafer blue, exactly like you were looking for. Because go loafers, we all want a bright blue couch in our living room. So now you're trying to think, oh, dang it. Is this couch going to fit around that really tight corner through my front door? Will I actually be able to fit this sectional in my house? And so maybe you close your eyes for a second and you think, okay, if I flip it up on its end and pivot, pivot, pivot <laughs> around the corner, yeah, I think it'll fit. And then I can turn it this way and put it in that corner and it'll look for me. What you just did was mental rotation. You took a picture, and you formed it in your head, and you moved it in a three-dimensional space. In another example, imagine that you're a student, and you're getting ready to take a test, and you're presented with a question that has something like this associated with it. And you go, oh no, I didn't study that. I studied that, and I studied that. All of these three things on the screen are exactly the same. They're just presented differently. One thing that might, this is what Google Images told me, is that they were all exactly the same. <laughs> Chemistry professors, we can argue later. You'll win. Okay, so one thing that might help you answer this test question is if you can imagine this molecule from multiple different perspectives and manipulate it in a three-dimensional space. Now, if you're like Dr. Bowen, I don't shop for furniture, I don't like organic chemistry, we can all agree that Tetris is fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> Tetris is mental rotation. You have to be able to picture this yellow shape in your brain and turn it to see if it fits right here in this space. So mental rotation involves maintaining and transforming spatial mental representation taking something in your head and moving it, even though it's not actually moving in front of you. What we know from previous research is that mental rotation is a really important skill. And people who tend to do well on mental rotation tasks also tend to excel in several different STEM disciplines, like chemistry, um, engineering, um, medical professions that involve surgery, and aviation. So in all of these different areas, being good at mental rotation increases the likelihood that you're going to excel in your field. Aviation, believe it or not. Dr. Wasiak doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> you want to know when you're upside down. You need to know when you're upside down in aviation, exactly. <laughs> this is also an important skill for chemistry classes. And I'm going to talk to you a lot about chemistry students today because that's who was involved in our research project. So the idea with this two-dimensional figure is that from this, you are supposed to be able to get depth information, and you should be able to picture that in your head. And you can do better on questions, especially in organic chemistry, if you're able to picture molecules from 
from multiple different perspectives. But what, what we were approached with at LSU from the chemistry department were faculty saying that their students really had a hard time with this, and they couldn't imagine things in a three-dimensional space. So while it would be fun to have people play Tetris or rearrange furniture in their head, in the lab, we use a different type of mental rotation task. So what you see here are two three-dimensional cubes, and your task is to determine if they are the same, identical to one another, or if they are mere images of each other. So what do you think? Are these the same or are they different? Who says same? Who says different? The rest of the room isn't voting. It's different. These two structures are rotated 120 degrees from one another. These two, on the other hand, are actually the same molecule. They're just rotated differently. So people do several of these trials making these same different type judgments. And what we suggest that our participants do is look at these two structures and imagine one of them rotating so you can line them up and confirm, yes, these two are exactly the same. In this case, you'd be doing the exact same thing, but here they're not exactly the same. They're mere image of one another. So let's see. Let's try some more practice here. Let's see how good mental rotators you all are. We'll start easy. This one, same or different? Who says same? Raise your hand. Who says different? All, none of, no one is voting. You all are ruining my demonstration. It's the same. It's the same, yes, this is same. And this should be relatively easy, because these two structures are only rotated about 20 degrees from one another. Let's do another one. What about this one? Same or different? Who says same? Who says different? They're the same. But these are rotated 80 degrees, so again, it's a farther rotation from each other. Let's try a little more complicated structure. Who says they're the same? Who says they're different? It's different. Good job. All right, one more. This is 140 degrees of rotation. Are they the same? Or are they different? Who says same? Who says different? They're the same. Okay, so you can imagine that this is a difficult task. People aren't necessarily jazzed to come to my lab and do this over and over for an hour. So there's a lot of different debates in the literature as to whether people are actually rotating in their head. So people could be rotating or Maybe they have a memory of what each structure looks like from multiple different perspectives. So you can imagine if you've done, say, 200 of these tasks and you're doing them over and over, maybe you have a vivid memory of what each of those structures looks like from different angles. Another possibility is that people are using different analytic strategies. And by analytic, I mean things like counting individual squares. So let's say you're presented with this, you might say, okay, there's two squares here, four squares here, that has to be a different trial. They can't be the same. That's not mental rotation. We have some evidence that people most often choose to mentally rotate shapes. Um, so this is research from the 70s by Shepard and Metzler. They did the exact same type of task that I just showed you all. Um, and what they found was that um, as angular disparity, or how far the two, mo um, two structures are rotated from one another, as angular disparity increases, response time increases. And they argue that this was because the farther you have to rotate two things, it literally takes you more time to do that. And they found this, these beautiful data, I mean this is an almost near perfect linear trend that as angular disparity increases, rotation or response time increases. We also know from previous research that training on this task makes people better. If you have people do this over and over, they will eventually get better at this task. However, what we don't know is does that improvement generalize? 
if I had organic chemistry students come in and do this block mental rotation task over and over, will they get better at organic chemistry? We also don't know what is actually changing that leads to this improvement. What are people doing differently that makes them perform better on this task? Maybe it's that they have increased brain activation in some area and that's helping them. Maybe it's that they're moving their eyes differently and paying attention to different types of things. But we don't know that at this point. And these are the types of questions we sought to answer in this project. So we have three primary research questions I'm going to walk you through. First, does mental rotation of molecules show a similar pattern of results to mental rotation of cubes? So there's all this research on this 3D mental rotation of these blocks. What if you have people do the same task with chemical structures? Can they still do it? Second, does training on that cubes task generalize to more complex stimuli like chemical structures? And finally, does this training impact attention allocation? Or what people are actually paying attention to? This last question is the why does training work question. So to answer this, we used a multi-session, multi-method design that was comprised of three large phases. Pre-training, training, and post-training. Pre-training, the very first time we saw our participants, they did several individual difference measures, um, like their ability to imagine things, how many video games they played, if they were in any sports, those types of things. And then they did the cubes task I just told you about, and a version with molecules. We then had them do a nearly identical task with the cubes while we were scanning um, for brain activation with an FMR. Um, this is essentially what the molecules task looked like. We had these grayscale three-dimensional molecules. None of them are actual chemical structures of anything because I made them up and I know very little about chemistry. Um, so the task is literally exactly the same. Are these the same? Are these different? For training, what we did is we had two groups. Our experimental group trained on the cubes task um, with these 3D mental rotate or 3D cubes. For training, we wanted to incentivize them to do as best as they could. So we gave them points. The harder the question, the more points they got. And we gave people prizes if they were a top scorer or most improved to really try to get people to want to do well on this task. And we did six training sessions over two to three weeks. Importantly, we didn't repeat any of the cube structures to make sure that people weren't just memorizing what the different cubes looked like. For our control training group, we used a number estimation task. Y'all are going to love this. Do these two groups of dots contain the same or different number of dots? Who says same? Who says different? They're the same, believe it or not. Whereas these are different. The nice thing about this task is a couple things. First, it's the exact same type of response. They're still saying same different. Two, we can manipulate how difficult the task is by changing how the discrepancy between the two displays, how many dots are in each. The smaller the difference between the two, the harder the task is going to be. Um, the other reason why we chose this task was because the performance on this is actually associated with another STEM skill, mathematical ability. So people who tend to do well on this task also tend to do well in math classes. Other than that, it was exactly the same. They still got points, more points for harder questions, and they had six training sessions over two to three weeks. So sessions three through eight were the two training sessions. And then we had post-training, where we did the exact same thing that we started with. So we saw each participant 10 different times over the course of about five to seven weeks. And we used several different techniques. 
any time when they worked in the MRI scanner, we also tracked their eye movements. So we knew exactly what they were looking at and what they were paying attention. Um, our final participant sample was 36 STEM majors. Um, on average, they were 19, and they were all enrolled in general chemistry one or two at LSU. Um, and at LSU, they have specific general chemistry classes for STEM majors, and so they were all enrolled in those classes. Okay, so does mental rotation of molecules show a similar effect to mental rotation of cubes? So what's plotted here is accuracy is on the y-axis from zero, meaning you got absolutely nothing right, to one, meaning you had perfect performance. On the x-axis here, we have angular disparity, or how far rotated those two structures were from one another. The purple line is going to be cubes. Um, the yellow line is going to be the molecules test. So first for accuracy, what we see is that as angular disparity increases, accuracy decreases which makes sense. The harder the task is, the lower accuracy. The question is, what do we find for this molecules task? Overall, we find a similar pattern. The molecules task is much more difficult. Accuracy overall is lower. The other thing I want to point out is that chance performance on this task, if you literally just push same, different, same, different, and guessed on every trial, that would be about, that would be 50% which is what that one demonstrates. So what this shows is that people are doing the task until you get above 60 degrees of angular disparity, and then they're just guessing. We can look at the exact same thing with response time. Um, the y-axis here is response time in milliseconds. And we overall find a similar trend in that as angular disparity increases, it takes participants longer to respond. And it takes them longer on the molecules task than the cubes task. So first we found that yes, overall, the molecules task shows similar mental rotation performance to the cubes. Now, the molecules task is more difficult, and that could simply be because the actual stimuli that people were presented with were a lot more complex. There's more parts to them, so maybe that's why. And uh, my lab at LSU is still investigating this question. So now the fun part, if we train people on this cubes task over and over, do they get better at rotating molecules? So for this, we're looking at accuracy again. Here I have chance plotted as the bottom of the graph. So even with the bottom would be complete guessing. Um, on the x-axis, we have the training group, and the, or the experimental group, and the control group. The yellow bars are before training. The purple bars are after. First, our groups did not differ before training, which, thank goodness, because they should be exactly the same because there was nothing different among them at that point. We found in the experimental group, we had a significant increase in performance for the cubes task, which again is expected because they did it twice a week for three weeks, so they should have gotten better at it. So they improved by about 16%. The control group also improved, but only by about 7%. So both groups improved, but the experimental group improved more. But again, what we really want to know is how did they do on the molecules task? Again, before training, the two groups had equivalent performance. After training, however, the experimental group had a significant increase in performance. It's a small increase. It's a 6% increase. But what this suggests is that training people on acute tasks could actually make them better at rotating molecules. So it appears that yes, mental rotation training does generalize across different stimuli types. So now we want to know, okay, what was it that made them better? What were they doing differently that improved performance? Before we talk about that, I'm going to talk to you about how cool eye tracking is. So this is my eye tracking setup at LSU. Um, the setup at UAK is very similar. 
Here you have an eye tracking camera. It has an infrared light emitter that projects infrared light onto your face. And then a camera that looks for where light is reflected back, and importantly, where no light is reflected back. So we all know your pupil is essentially a giant opening in your eye, and there's no light reflected back from that. And so that's how the computer knows exactly where you're looking on this screen at any point in time. And then I, as the researcher, can sit here and track your eye movements throughout the entire task. So let's say you come to my lab and I sit you down and I show you this picture of downtown Kearney. And I just tell you to look around. The first thing you might notice is, dang it, I forgot to schedule my six month cleaning at the dentist. I need to do that. And then you look, okay, is my friend walking up the sidewalk? No. And then you think, wow, parking is never this good downtown. This is incredible. And then you look back across the street. The nice thing about eye tracking is I know where you're looking, how long you looked there. I might even be able to tell if you looked somewhere, even if you don't think you looked. So it's such a sensitive measure that I know exactly where people are looking and how long they're looking there. This is an example of what an eye tracking trial looks like um, for this task. So this is an actual participant. The pink dot in the middle is the center of their pupil. And this is slowed down to 50% of normal speed. And then they make their response. So what I want to know is, I can look at how participants are moving their eyes and see if over training, do those eye movements change? Do they pay attention to different things? Are they comparing things differently? And I wouldn't be able to do that without looking at eye tracking. Now we're going to get a little technical, and we're going to talk about the difference between global versus local attention allocation. So imagine that you come upstairs to Cunningham's, and you are looking for Dr. Hill, because you're going to sit with him. The first thing you might do when you come through the door is sort of broadly look around, to see if he just jumps out at you anywhere. Can you see him real quick just by glancing around? That's a global attention strategy. You're spreading your attention across the room. If you don't find him on your first quick glance, you might switch to a local attention allocation, where you look at each person's face at each table until you spot Dr. Hill. So the difference between global and local attention allocation is sort of, are you paying attention to the big picture, or are you looking at the nitty gritty details? When we talk about this with eye tracking, we often talk about it with saccade amplitude. A saccade is just when you're moving your eyes between two individual fixations. So let's say you're looking at this um, cube arrangement here, you start fixating here, you could then saccade, move your eyes up to the top and then down before you make another saccade across to the other object. You now might make a few shorter saccades. So this over here has a larger saccade amplitude than this picture over here. You then might saccade back and make a couple more fixations. Questions about saccade amplitude? Okay. So, what we can look at is, after training, do people use a more global or local attention strategy? Are they paying attention to big picture holistic things, or are they paying attention to those nitty gritty details? So, first let's look at the cube's task. On the y-axis here, we have saccade amplitude. Remember, higher numbers mean more global attention allocation, paying attention to those big picture things. Otherwise, the graph is set up the same with training group on the x-axis, pre-training's in yellow, post-training's in purple. And this is what we find. Overall, saccade amplitude increases after training. I will admit, teeny, teeny, tiny little effects. It's a small increase. It is statistically significant, but this is one of the benefits of a multi-method design, is that these aren't the only data I have. I have lots of data to back up. 
we also find the exact same thing in the molecules task. Again, it's a really small increase, but it is statistically significant in that after training, people are using a more global or holistic way to look at these stimuli. The next thing that we can look at is how many times they switch back and forth between the molecules or between the structures. As you can imagine, with a more global attention strategy, you're going to make fewer switches because you're processing things in a global or holistic way. So now we're looking at how many times did people switch back and forth. For the cubes task, we found that overall, the number of switches people made decreased after training, but that decrease was larger in the experimental group than in the control group. For the molecules task, however, there was only a very small decrease in the number of switches, and there were no differences between our two groups. So this suggests that people are making longer saccades and fewer switches back and forth as a result of training. So this would suggest that mental rotation training is impacting their attention allocation. They're looking at things from a more global, big picture standpoint and focusing less on those nitty gritty details. But wait, there's more. <laughs> so if you remember, I also tracked brain activation and how that changed before and after training. And that's what we're going to talk about now. So session two and session ten were when I um, measured brain activation while they were doing the cubes task. We didn't have them do the molecules task in the scanner simply because we had a lack of resources to do that. And each of these tasks took about an hour to do. So we measured neuro. Uh, we measured brain activation with an fMRI. So this is exactly what our standard looked like. Participants lay on this bed up here, and then this bed retracts back down into this tube where they can see a screen with two cube configurations presented on it, and they just respond same different. Okay, so the first thing we want to know is can we predict what group someone was in just based on looking at their brain activity? And we did this by looking at a couple key brain areas. First are these yellow and green areas, are commonly called the visuospatial network. It's this part of the brain that's associated with thinking about things in a spatial way or a three-dimensional way. The other brain areas we were interested in is motor cortex, which are these dark and light blue. This is the part of your brain that's active when you're looking at things move, when you're moving, when you think about moving, those types of things. Finally, the pink and red areas down here is part of your lateral occipital cortex. Your lateral occipital cortex is involved with a lot of different things. Um, the one thing that we were really interested in was it tends to be associated with thinking about the relationship among very different things. Um, so maybe the relationship between one part of a cube and another part of a cube. So here's what we found. Brain activation after training is what's plotted here. And we put brain activation in all of these different regions into our model. And what we found is that if you look at right motor, motor cortex and right lateral occipital cortex, we can predict what group people were in with 80% accuracy. So 80% of the time, we can tell if someone was in the experimental group or the control group just by looking at their brain activation in these two areas, which I think is super, super cool. We know nothing about these participants in this model other than exactly what their brain activation is, and we're 80% correct. The next thing we wanted to look at was, can we predict people's performance just looking at their brain activation? So here, these were the two regions um, that were statistically significant in this first analysis. Um, what's plotted here is brain activation on the y-axis and their accuracy before training. So before we've done anything, they're just doing the task. And what we find is that people who have greater activation in this visual spatial network here 
tend to have higher accuracy. And the same thing is true for this other region, also part of this um, visuospatial network. So it appears that there are differences among people who just tend to do better at mental rotation tasks and people who tend to struggle with that. The next thing we looked at was motor cortex activation, which is in pink right here. And what we found here was that um, what's plotted here is accuracy improvement. Okay, so if you're right at zero, you did not improve at all from pre-training to post-training. So the farther to the right you are, the more you improved. And what we found was that there is this relationship between how much you improved and motor cortex activation, which suggests that people that improve the most also have the most brain activation in that part of their brain that's involved with movement. So overall, this suggests that by looking at specifically motor cortex, visuospatial cortex, and that lateral occipital cortex, that really mental rotation doesn't rely on one specific brain area. But it's a network of several different brain areas that lead to this improvement in performance. Okay, what does this mean for teaching STEM skills in the classroom? First of all, it's important that we understand the mechanisms of mental rotation. We need to know what are the actual processes going on with this task before we can know how to make people better at it. Second, it's important not to get caught up in all the nitty gritty details and sometimes to think about things from a global or a holistic, big picture standpoint. Second, even basic mental rotation practice helps. So if you have a student who's, say, struggling to transform this into this, one suggestion might be that they practice with very basic mental rotation before applying it to more complex areas. Next, <coughs> multi-method designs are valuable. We had a wide variety of effects that I talked to you about, from behavioral to eye tracking to neuroimaging. And what I hope that I've done today is paint a big picture about how all of these different measures tell us something different about mental rotation tasks. And finally, please consider collaborating outside of your department. My lab never would have even thought of investigating this if we hadn't been approached by the chemistry department asking why their students couldn't mentally rotate. And we got a lot of help from the computer science department with funding and other programming resources that really made this whole project possible. Thank you for your attention and I welcome any questions you might have. Um, so I think it's sort of 
a little bit of stepping back and looking at that big picture. Uh, there's a lot of different constructs involved with this, and it's likely not just one thing. And of course, the other thing, if I can, real quick, mm -hmm. I noticed a similarity between the uh, chemistry models and the PSVT model and the, the produced patient visualization test for patients. In fact, if you give her those lines, mm -hmm. and supposedly the test knocks off the analytical possibility of solving the problem. And I was curious, is did you look at that model or as, as a possible? Because it's very similar to your test, so mm -hmm. uh, except that it's very fun. Okay. Yeah, I'm not familiar with that. Um, I know there's a lot of different mental rotation tasks with a wide variety of different types of stimuli, um, and some that are less linear, per se. Um, overall, they tend to show the same general pattern, in that with training studies, if you train people over and over on the same thing, they get better. But that's a good point. That's definitely literature that we can look into. I was just curious. You know, I love it. Don't get me wrong. I love, I love the multi approach because the research that I did was kind of straightforward. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that was just brilliant. Oh, as far as the, the brain thing, uh, as far as bringing that up, as far as particular sections of the brain lighting up, so mm -hmm. in that case, did you find the correlation between <laughs> Let me click forward to some bonus slides at the end of my book. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't make the cut. Where are you at? Here we go. <laughs> so the first thing that we did with brain activation is we wanted to see were there different brain areas that were involved with rotating and with not rotating. And by not rotating, I literally mean just looking at these pictures and pushing a button when they came up. And so how we defined those brain regions that I highlighted was by looking at first, oops, I killed the clicker. There it is. Um, first, by looking at which brain areas were active when you were rotating, and then we created specific regions of interest from those data. <laughs> Thank you. Other questions? Oh, yeah. So yeah. you noticed a functional lateralization, uh, like it was put in the right hemisphere. Yeah. So is there any morphological? I mean, I can't. You can't just look at the brain and see if the neurons or astrocytes or something is similar. If there's morphological similarity, has, has anyone looked at maybe rodents or something in these regions, or see if their function matches the structure? Yeah, that's a really fantastic question. Um, when we found our results primarily lateralized in the right hemisphere with predicting what training group people were in, I did a lot of reading to try to find if people consistently got activation in the right hemisphere or the left, and I didn't find anything. Um, it seems sort of a mixed bag. There's some research, and the conclusions are not very strong, that right hemisphere activation can be associated with more big picture attentional type things. Um, but that's a really good question. And I think that's an area that's lacking of, this is essentially correlational work where we're seeing increases in brain activation associated with different things. Um, but it's certainly an area where you could use animal models and lesion those specific areas and see if people have that. Great question. Other questions? Yes, Dr. Lesley. all of your responses all of the responses were about presses, yes. All of the tasks in the same plane, the rotation, or something um, The tasks, the molecules in the cubes were either rotated along the x-axis or the z-axis. So they were mixed? They were mixed, yes. And the last thing is I noticed that the one learning thing you had, the, the graph up there, the canvas were pretty close to the chains. Yeah. Were they significantly different than chains? Not, um, when you collapse a cross angle of rotation, yes, they are significantly different from chains. Now these were just chemi chemistry students, not majors. Yes, so they were, all of them were STEM majors of some kind, but not all of them were chemistry majors. Okay, so I got to test the hypothesis that everything I can say is just the chains. <laughs> Possibly. <laughs> Yeah. Was there a sex difference between any of your any of your data that you found? That is a fantastic question. 
Um, most, very often in mental rotation tasks, you will find a sex difference in that men tend to be better at mental rotation than women. Um, with our sample, there was a numeric difference in that at baseline, men were about three or four percentage points more accurate than women. It wasn't a significant difference. And those differences were completely gone after training. Yes? I have a couple of questions. One is, um, have you considered, like in this holistic idea, have you considered uh, panning to uh, students who are like of the humanities persuasion, so mm -hmm. the humanities side of life, to see how this would shift? A, B, what role do environmental conditions play? So like, I'm thinking like, a, like does stress accelerate the process or relaxation reinforce the process? Or how does that, have you thought about that? That's a really good point. Um, we, my lab at LSU, my advisor's lab, is in the process of replicating this experiment with psychology majors, mainly because we have a really big psychology subject pool and they are easy to get to win. <laughs> Um, in terms of the environment, I haven't looked at anything specifically with mental rotation, but there's a lot of research out there about um, the attention restoration effect, yeah. and that walking in nature or doing very wide open spaces can actually restore your attention and predispose you to more global or holistic processing. Um, so that's something we could definitely look at. I've looked at that with other questions, but not related to mental rotation. You know, to follow up with what David asked, might find differences in the different kinds of art that a student is studying with sculpture, certainly you would predict to be better than visual rotation versus uh, two-dimensional visual artists. Maybe not, I don't know. That's really interesting. Yeah, my advisor, Melissa Beck, her brother's an artist, and she brought him into the lab because she had a similar scenario and had him do this mental rotation task. The problem that we had was he really wanted to do well for his sister, and so he took a really, really long time to do it. Um, but it's an interesting question, and I think it certainly can be related to something like that. Right, it's also related to athletics, too. Yeah, yeah, wrestlers tend to do better on mental rotation than other sports. <laughs> and other types of rotation. Yeah, so you didn't limit their time that they could take on each unit? Sure. For this study we did, they had to respond in 10 seconds. Oh, okay. And we did that based on other pilot work because if you give people unlimited time, they will take unlimited time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. The block, any of the block ones were like pictures we saw the blocks lined up in various shapes. Mm -hmm. Spear ones, or round ones, were they always like chemical models? So how I made the chemical models is I looked up 3D uh, chemical structures that I could download, a very common chemical structures, and then I added and deleted things until they weren't common chemical structures anymore. They were, round, like they were always round. round, yes. So but you didn't have other round ones lined up like the block ones, right? No, that's actually what my, um, my advisor's for PhD student is talking about. And where they were round. Yeah. If you go to it, maybe the chemists just need to change their tinker voice. <laughs> That's a very good. Cool. So literally, my lab sister at LSU is spending her entire semester looking at our cube stimuli and turning them to look like the molecule stimuli um, to see if that's something that's impacting us. So that's a that's a great question, and I can update you when she's eventually done Photoshop. <laughs> Yeah, okay. Excellent is excluded in the end. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, okay. But what, what kind of model do you prefer? Because I know that there are kind of tinker toy models, and then there's the rounded kind of models, and, and then also the two dimensional ones. Which ones do you find easier to work Yeah, the ball and stick models are using class. But one thing I was going to say is, I mean, I, there, of course, there's a lot more of a challenge for organic learning organic chemistry than just mental rotation. That's just one area. I mean, one one thing that I one thing that I've noticed, and this is very anecdotal, but I've had some music majors, and they tend to do fairly well in organic chemistry. And it's not necessarily the mental rotation. I think it's the symbolism, being able to see like an abstract symbol and relate it to a concept. And they seem to be a little bit better at that. Interesting. So it's, 
I mean, organic people who teach organic chemistry are gonna probably complain a lot about mental rotation, but that is, I would say, just one part of where students struggle with it. Mm -hmm. And I think that abstract, being able to see something abstractly is also a big challenge. Definitely, um, I'm sure. And I don't know even how you get at that, studying <laughs> that, but yeah. Do you have a way to get at that? <laughs> I could try to get at that question. <laughs> As someone who never took Beyond General Chemistry 1 and 2 in undergrad, I would need to consult with Dr. Thomas rather extensively. Collaboration. <laughs> Collaboration outside of my department. Exactly. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. Did you consider handedness? We did consider handedness. So if you're not familiar, the vast majority of fMRI research only uses right-handed participants. Um, only, it just so happens that left-handed people are infrequent. Um, and so only two of our 36 participants were left-handed. And so it's not likely to bias the results in any way. Overall, their data weren't significantly different behaviorally from anybody else. But great question. We did have several left-handed people that were excited to be in our study, because most of the time when they tried to volunteer for other brain imaging studies, they wouldn't be able to do it because they were left. Yeah. Are you familiar with any of the literature about using the eye tracking software um, people trying to read a figure mm -hmm. in a book or a journal article and those that are more successful go back and forth between the figure and those that are less successful just keep reading the text over and over and over? Yeah, there's a lot of literature on that in people that uh, quote unquote, better students um, tend to look at the figures more and relate things back and forth. I'm familiar with a little bit of that literature. Um, from a training perspective, what a lot of people have done is try to, if I show you a replay of the eye movements of someone who is really good at this class, will you then read the textbook differently, learning from that? And it doesn't appear that people utilize that information very effectively. Um, so I know that that literature exists, and that's one of the benefits of eye tracking is if you ask a student, how do you read the textbook, they're going to say, well, I read the textbook, and I look at this, and then I read the textbook more. Well, I ask students what they do with the figures, and some of them don't look at the figures at all. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff with that with textbook companies and the little pop-out figures and bonus material boxes, and a lot of students... Yeah, or they can't, they don't understand the figures, so they mm -hmm. don't talk. Yeah. They just read the text mm -hmm. yet another time. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Okay. Any more questions? Okay, well, let's thank Dr. Mohan for what a wonderful talk. chance to um, actually tell you all about the next Science Cafe that's coming up. It'll be February 17th here. Myself and Dr. Doug Biggs from History, so we're collaborating on this. Um, we see we do these about once a year, uh, where Dr. Biggs talks about the history of a topic, and I talk about the science of the topic. And we chose this time to talk about Queen Anne, so if you've seen the movie The Favorite, which is a wonderful movie, uh, we're going to talk about her reign and also all of her medical maladies that she had and what was actually going on with her, at least we think so as of what's been we found in the last month in the literature. So um, it'll be up here at the same time on February 17th. I hope everybody can come and join us. But that make sure to tip your waitress uh, very well because she did a good job for us tonight. Thank you very much.